today we're taking a look at every single official console variation for the GBA that Nintendo ever licensed and produced. I've got a range of different systems here, dating from 2001 all the way up to 2008, with something very special inside this suitcase here, which I can't wait to share with everyone. So without further ado, let's get started with the first official release of the Game Boy Advance, which came out in 2001. It came out in Japan on March 21st, in America on June 11th, and here in the UK on June the 22nd. It was actually the first ever console that I got on day one. As for the games I got with it, I've got one of them here. This was Rayman Advance, and I was just blown away by the graphics. I'd been reading about it in magazines up until that point, and I was so excited. I got Rayman here, and I got another game called Pino B Wings of Adventure, which I don't have the box for here, unfortunately, so I'll put it in my hand. There you go. And I loved both of the games, and a bit later on I got things like Mario Advance, and then pretty much all the major releases after that too. In Japan, it actually launched with 25 different games, which was a big range of games from all different genres, and it was a fantastic launch lineup, and the GBA got off to a fantastic start right out of the gate. And I loved everything about the system, apart from one thing, and that was the fact that it didn't have a backlight. Of course, none of the Game Boys before it did, outside of Japan at least, but it was a huge problem with the GBA, considering the screen was even darker than the systems that had come before it. And Nintendo was listening, because two years after the launch in 2003, the Game Boy Advance SP came out with a front-lit screen. The letters SP actually stood for Special Project, and I still don't really know what they mean by that, because surely every system is a special project. But even so, the SP introduced a lot of new features to the Game Boy Advance family, including not only the clamshell design, but most importantly the backlight, but also a rechargeable lithium-ion battery, which was actually the first Nintendo handheld to feature such a modern advancement such as that. There was one thing missing from the SP though over the original, and that was the fact that on the original you actually had a headphone socket on the bottom, but Nintendo did an Apple 20 years before Apple pulled it off and actually removed the headphone jack. Apart from that, every little thing about the Game Boy Advance SP, in my opinion anyway, was a huge step up over the original. I know some people prefer the design and the way the original feels, but I got really used to the SP and I remember actually sitting there as a kid and thinking handheld gaming just can't get any better than this. If there was one handheld that I would want to play forever, it would be the Game Boy Advance SP, especially with the fact that it was backwards compatible with my favourite system of all time, the original Game Boy. I just had so many hours and hours of entertainment out of this device. And again, like the original Game Boy Advance, I got this one on day one as well, and it actually came out seven days after my birthday here in the UK. And I remember on my birthday, I opened up my envelope for my parents, and inside, in the card, it said, I owe you one Game Boy Advance SP, coming on the 27th of March. And I was so excited that week must have felt like an eternity. 2003 also marked the release of the Game Boy Player for the GameCube. This was actually an attachment for the GameCube that goes in the bottom of the console here into the extension port and allows you to play Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color and original Game Boy games on the system. I didn't get this as it released, I actually got that for Christmas that year and I absolutely loved it. Again, being able to play Game Boy Advance games on a big screen, I just loved it. I'd always loved the Super Game Boy for the SNES and I felt like this was the next evolution of that to allow me to play even more games and the game I have the fondest memories of playing using the Game Boy Player was actually the first Golden Sun. That was how I played the majority of that game and I remember when you first leave that village at the start and you go out into the big open world and you see those Mode 7 style graphics, it just felt like playing a SNES game again on the TV and I've had many great experiences with the Game Boy Player. Of course, as you probably know these days, the quality of the Game Boy Player's output isn't the best, but you can actually get some homebrew fixes that use something called GBI, the Game Boy Interface, which allows you to get a much better picture quality out of the Game Boy Player. And because of that, this is actually still the best way to capture footage for a lot of Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games. It's what I use to get all my footage for all of my homebrew release videos. So absolutely love the Game Boy Player and it's a really great addition and I'm so sad that no Nintendo consoles after the GameCube went back to include their handhelds in the support for the system. The Wii U kind of did with the DS Virtual Console games, but it's just not the same as putting a physical cartridge into the system itself. So absolutely love the Game Boy Player and I wish Nintendo would revisit that idea. 
Moving on to 2004 now, and Nintendo was leaving the GBA in the dust to bring out the Nintendo DS. Well, according to them they weren't anyway, because they actually called the DS a third pillar in their console lineup. And thanks to the fact that the DS wasn't a true replacement to the Game Boy Advance, they did actually include a Game Boy Advance cartridge slot in the bottom of the DS. And it's not the most ideal way of playing GBA games. The screen on this is quite nice, even if you're coming from the Game Boy Advance SP, because the DS was actually backlit instead of frontlit. It doesn't have the best screen, but at least it has a backlight. The main downside I have with playing GBA games on here is the fact that they show up in quite a small border on the top or the bottom screen, depending on which screen you want to show it on. But because the DS is only 4x3 instead of widescreen, it does shrink the screen size down a little bit, so you're actually left with a smaller view compared to playing it on the original or the SP. But even so, I did put a lot of time into playing GBA games on the DS. I especially have fond memories at the start of college, playing things like Castlevania on the DS using the Game Boy Advance slot. And it was the way I played GBA games for many years. That was until the DS Lite came out a few years later but I'm not skipping ahead just yet because there was something else really interesting in the Game Boy Advance's history that came out in 2004 and I don't actually have this one to show off here but it was basically a Chinese version of the original Game Boy Advance called the IQ GBA. IQ being Nintendo's subsidiary in China that allows them to release consoles in that region. I do actually have an IQ Game Boy Advance SP as you can see at the bottom there it actually says IQ on it and this was released in 2004 five and this one actually has a brighter backlit screen because this version here was actually based on something else that came out in 2005 called the Game Boy Advance SP 101 which was basically the exact same as a regular Game Boy Advance but it featured a much brighter fully backlit screen and this version of the SP is very hard to come by today and there's only one way of figuring out whether it's an original SP or whether it's this new model here and that is by looking at the label on the back here and checking to see whether it says 101 instead of 001 so they're very sought after so if you are looking for a Game Boy SP always check the back of the photos when it's on sale to check to see whether it's a 101 version before we get into everything else from 2005 though there was something really interesting which actually got cancelled but it was going to be an official project or at least that's how the developers thought of it at the time and this is actually a cancelled way of playing Game Boy Advance games on a mobile phone. The idea these developers had was to actually incorporate the Game Boy Advance hardware into mobile phones and actually have a download store on the phone where you could search it through Wi-Fi and actually download Game Boy Advance ROMs, kind of like you do today with the Nintendo eShop, and actually play them on the phone itself. It sounds like a great idea and I think it would have done really well, but there were a few hurdles that they just couldn't quite address in order to get this out into the public. But if you are interested in what could have been, there was a really interesting article on Medium which I'll link down in the description below. It's definitely worth a read to find out what could have been, and maybe Nintendo could have competed with Nokia and the N-Gage. So although the Game Boy Advance SP-101 came out in 2005, there was another Game Boy Advance that also came out in 2005. And bear in mind that all this happened the year after the successor, the DS, came out. So it was kind of a strange out of left field release for Nintendo, but later that year they released this, the Game Boy Micro. And I absolutely love this device. It's so small and it's so compact. Just look at a size comparison here compared to the Game Boy Advance. The difference is just insane. It's barely any bigger than a Game Boy Advance game. And I didn't actually get this one at launch. In fact, I wasn't planning to get this at all because I was already really happy with my original DS. But my parents surprised me at Christmas and I actually got this as a Christmas Eve present. And I was just blown away. I was not expecting to ever get this. So, And I also got this game here to go alongside it called Banjo Pilot, which came out the same year. And I loved the game and I loved the system. As I said, the form factor is just amazing. It also has a really nice screen, by far the best quality screen that Nintendo had ever made up until that point. And a few years ago when I was in Japan, back in 2014, wow, a few years ago, nine years ago now when I was in Japan for the first time, I actually picked up this, which was the Famicom 20th anniversary edition of the Game Boy Micro. And I just love the design of this one so, so much. And I'm so glad that I managed to actually get this and add it to my personal collection because this is probably my favorite looking Nintendo device out of everything. Of course, the Game Boy Micro didn't really sell that well, but I don't really think Nintendo 
Nintendo made it expecting it to sell well. It was more of a fashion accessory more than anything, or more of a look what we can do, look at the technology we can cram into something so small. I think maybe they were going off Apple's idea with the iPod Nano and things like that, and it definitely feels like an Apple product. It's very sleek, it's very stylized, and I absolutely love it, I really do. And the Game Boy Micro did actually get a release in China the same year under the IQ range, and they also got the IQ version of the Game Boy Advance SP that year too. And then the year after, 2006, and the launch of the DS Lite, which is Nintendo's final way of playing Game Boy Advance games. A few people were actually surprised that they still kept Game Boy Advance functionality, and I'm glad they did, although it is a little bit strange that the Game Boy Advance games now actually stick out from the bottom. So if I put a Game Boy Advance game in here now, you can actually see that it doesn't click all the way down like it does in every other version of the GBA. It actually sticks out a little bit. But it didn't stop me once again having a great time with my Game Boy Advance games and my DS games. So I just loved the uh, DS Lite in general. It's such a massive improvement over the original DS. Everything about it is just designed so much better. Except... Except maybe the hinge, as you can see my hinge is completely broken after many years of wear and tear. But apart from that, I love the device, the buttons feel great, the screens again were a massive step up, finally Nintendo had better screens than on the Game Boy Micro, and I had a lot of fun playing Game Boy Advance games on this thing, even though it was 2006, and the Game Boy Advance was at the end of its life, let's say that. And that was the last official Game Boy from Nintendo, but Nintendo actually licensed the Game Boy technology out to a company called Visteon, who were actually a manufacturer of car DVD players and accessories and things like that. So this brings us to this suitcase here and the final piece of the Game Boy Advance puzzle, the Visteon Dockable Entertainment. And here it is, and this is something that I never thought I would get my hands on. And I have to say a massive thank you to Quang from Asobi Tech for letting me borrow this to make this video here today. And what an incredible piece of kit it is as well. It was very, very expensive when it first came out. And you could actually only buy it in car manufacturers and in showrooms in, in America. So it is a very sought after piece of kit today. It has a massive 10.2 inch screen and on the back there that's where you put your Game Boy Advance games and you actually control it with this infrared controller here which is actually exactly the same as a Sky game controller. So if you do end up losing it you can actually replace it with the Sky controller. And surprisingly, considering it's only infrared, it actually works surprisingly well. I could move around it from all different angles and I could still play no problem and there was also no perceivable lag either. It doesn't play original Game Boy games, so it's very much like the DS, where you can only play Game Boy Advance games on it. And they don't quite fill the screen. You can actually press the screen button at the top to switch between two different resolutions, but it's either original Game Boy Advance resolution or slightly stretched in the widescreen ratio. So I'm not really sure why you'd want to do that. It doesn't actually fill the entire screen, which it could have, honestly. So it is a little bit disappointing from that point of view, but it's still so cool that I actually get to experience this for the first time and I never thought I would be able to so again thank you so much and this came out in 2006 but that is not where the Game Boy Advance story ends either because in 2008 Visteon actually made an upgraded version of this with a very slightly smaller screen which was actually only seven inches across and this version could actually fit inside the headrests on the car whereas this one would either have to be attached to something that pulled down from the ceiling or just placed on your lap so that is officially the final end of the Game Boy Advance but obviously many companies since have made their own versions of the GBA and made things that are compatible with Game Boy Advance cartridges. If you enjoy Game Boy Advance history and you want to see where Nintendo got its start with the development of the system leading up to the release of the original Game Boy Advance then please go ahead and check out my video up here. I had a lot of fun researching for that one and please subscribe because there is more Game Boy Advance history coming soon. Goodbye.